Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Office Hours. Uh, thank you for waiting in the lobby. I hope you had snacks. And there were some fun highlights magazines. That's, I don't know. Does anybody know? Um, today we have someone wonderful following up from the mini webinar we had here a while ago with some uh, frequently asked questions and we can probably get him to also do a song or two in, you know, if we entice him. A wonderful, talented man. Uh, he is the William W. L. Glenn Professor of Surgery and the founding director of the Yale Aortic Center. And he is my friend and his name is Dr. John Elif Teriades. Dr. E, if you're nasty. What? Hey, Dr. E. What's up? Hi, Amy. I yeah, you don't want me to sing, Amy. No. Our glee club in high school, they needed voices desperately and oh. they kicked me out. So you don't want me to sing. No, the way you present that story in a positive light is you wanted to sing in the worst way and you actually achieved your goal. Well, we are very happy to have you joining us, both of you. Um, and we have a whole list of questions here to get through that you want to Ellen, say who you are. Oh, yes, briefly. My name is Ellen Hostetler. I am the Chief Science Officer for the John Ritter Foundation. Um, and uh, I am here to bring your questions to an expert. So we have a whole list of questions that you all sent in ahead of time, and I'll be working through those. But if you have questions that you didn't send ahead of time, uh, feel free to type them in the chat and we are going to prioritize uh, those ones first. So hopefully we can get to everyone, um, but if we don't get to your question, fear not because we are going to continue doing these webinars and question and answer with experts throughout the year. So um, I promise we're gonna be covering pretty much every topic related to aortic health that you may have. Um, so with that- oh, I'm so sorry. I'm going to pop off, but I'm going to be listening. If anybody needs me to pop back on, too bad I'll be drinking a Diet Coke in my kitchen. No, I will I will pop back on. We'll sing for you. Yeah. Dr. E, have Thank fun. You, Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Amy. Tell Thank me you, Amy. If um, so I will just jump in here with a few. If you have questions that you want to type in the chat, I recommend trying to keep it short and sweet so that we can get through as many as possible. Um, because, of course, uh, our expert time is limited. So we want to uh, make sure that we can answer as many people's questions as possible. Um, and there's already been one in the chat, so let's just go with that one first. Um, can you have an aortic dissection without an aneurysm? So this is one people ask all the time. Do all dissections start off as aneurysms or, you know, which way do they go? Um, <clears throat> it is possible to have a dissection without an aneurysm, but it's uncommon especially in the ascending aorta here in the front. Usually the ascending aorta would be at least moderately to severely dilated. And that's what an aneurysm is. It's a dilated aorta. So it can happen on occasion, but not often. When it does happen, it's, it, it's likely to be in the context of a major inherited disease as the cause of the aorta, something like Marfan's or Ehlers Danlos or Lois Dietz or some inherited genetic abnormality. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And along those lines, we got another question ahead of time, which is sometimes people hear the words enlargement, aneurysm, ectasia. Are those all the same thing? Do they refer to different diseases? How should we think about those terms? Yeah, um, they, they're all very closely related. We usually use aneurysm to mean that the ascending aorta has exceeded four centimeters in diameter. Got it. That could also be called enlarged. It could be called aneurysmal. Um, ectasia uh, can be used as well, although it's more properly applied to a meandering aorta that's lengthened. So it, goes back and forth like a, a mountain a road. Got it. Okay. Um, next one we got here in the chat. Um, so sometimes you might get a measurement after your imaging 4.2, 4.4, 4.3. 4 
And it seems like, are you, is your, is it growing a little bit and shrinking a little bit? Are these kind of within the margin of error? You know, why does it kind of sometimes change even if maybe it really hasn't grown? Yes, that's a very good question, a very important point. And we make this point when we're teaching to audiences that aren't expert in aortic disease. There is a built-in error of measurement, even within one modality, mm -hmm. within the echo modality, within the CAT scan modality, and within the MRI modality. Mm -hmm. I could measure the same patient's aorta on the same imaging study two different days and get something that's two or three or sometimes four millimeters different. And then when you, when you mix echoes with CAT scans and MRIs, you can get markedly different measurements. My advice to the listeners is don't sweat minor differences, 4.2 to 4.4, 3.9 to 4.1. Those happen just by the process of measurement. The aorta never gets smaller. <coughs> it never uh, shrinks on its own. Um, and it very rarely grows rapidly. If you're having your imaging studies every couple of years, it would be very unusual for the aorta to grow more than one millimeter or two millimeters mm -hmm. in the space of one to two years. Mm -hmm. That is such great info. I know a lot of people hang on that measurement and it's important to remember, like you said, these are one or two millimeters. Sometimes it's a very small, uh, small little measurement there. So uh, that is great, I'm sure, advice for folks who are really hanging on those measurements. And if you think about it also, it depends on the uh, operating principles at the particular center. If you have one study done at Mayo, another done at UCLA or whatever, because one can include the wall of the aorta in the measurement, mm. like the outside of a cylinder, or one can include just the inner channel, what we call the lumen of the aorta. And that's gonna make a difference of two to four millimeters right there because the aortic wall itself is about two millimeters thick. John, can I ask a quick one? Please, Amy. And I, 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 I feel like you are the one who told me this because you are the one with the analogies that I like. We share these analogies, but also because it's a tube I'm thinking of it like, and you know, Mike told you, my dad, like all all Lebanese dads, was a butcher had a had a had a butcher shop, right? And you think of like a bologna or something, and you cut it this way, and it's a circle, and it's that measurement. And then if there's any kind of angle on it, it actually makes a different measurement because it's like an elliptical, like cut, like when you slice julienne, like the surface is. And so I, it's always fascinating to me if people get a measurement, even if they did it on the same day on a different machine, this might be more like a CT thing I'm talking about because of like the slicing element. And it wouldn't even have to be the difference of like where it's being calculated because everybody's aorta would be at a different angle. So isn't the, oh, he quit because I'm talking too much. Um, I feel like it's, if it's, it's better when you have the same equipment every time, even if you can do it like at the same office every time. Mm -hmm. Uh oh, did we lose John? <laughs> um, I, I, I have definitely uh, heard that Tell advice me. from cardiologists as well about, um, you know, get, keeping standardized with the measure and your tools that you are And the using. tools, right? Yeah. Because absolutely. just a little bit of an angle change, right? Oh, You're yeah. incredible. That, that is a very important point. We call it obliquity of measurement. Obliquity of measurement. I remember you telling me that. And the other thing, the way I explained it to someone is when you look at a marbled rye, this is a Seinfeld episode. It has like the two. And when you're looking at slices, it looks different every every slice. That's like when you're look, putting the slices together from a like from a CAT scan, right? Look, you're proud of me. <laughs> that is amazing. No, I'm so glad you brought that up and you explained it so well. And obliquity, many of our listeners probably know that the ascending aorta comes up to the top of the chest and then makes a U-turn. Right. And the most common reason for an, a measurement to indicate erroneous rapid enlargement 
is, is that somebody here? measures obliquely at the top of the aortic arch. So you're going to get a hot dog. I'm going to continue your food analogy. Yeah, 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 if yeah. yeah. Do this. If it's oblique, you'll get a hot dog rather than a circle. And that's the most common reason for erroneous measurements. And those are made every day. Right. Mm -hmm. So what, what is the, I don't know if you could hear us talking. I don't know where you went there for a second. Um, but did you hear us talking? Is it, So it's, if you can, you have the same equipment every time, right? Yes. So yes. whoever's following same you. Modality, you know. Same modality, modality, same equipment, and, and same principles of measurement with the wall or without the wall. Right, right, right. And how do you as a and, patient assure that we that you get a written note signed by you or you just, we could put something up on our website maybe at some point for someone who's who's going in for the first time saying it's recommended that uh, blah, blah, blah modalities. Amy, about two years ago, my team and I, we worked very, very hard and we wrote a paper in JAC, J-A-C-C, the yeah. Journal of the American College of Cardiology. Yeah. And, and we have, we have a, a beautiful artist's rendition of all these sources of error. I can provide it to you. Please. Um, and it's, it's interpretable by a lay individual as well. That's and all it ever asked for. And, and then to, to show you how complex it can be for echo, for an echo measurement of the aorta, it includes one wall and omits the opposite wall. I've and that's that. the standard technique. So, so you're focusing on really important points. As a follow-up question, we had some, yeah, thank you, Amy. Uh, pop in when you, when you want. We had someone ask, is it really important to get gated CT? Is it's incredibly important to get a gated CT. A gated CT will be done at the exact same point in the cardiac cycle. You know, the aorta is expansive. It, 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 with every contraction of the heart, it spreads a little more. And then in between contractions, it comes in. A gated CAT scan will, will take the image at exactly the same spot on your EKG. So the aorta will be open or closed. If you, if you do a non-gated CAT scan in the present era, you're going to get a funny image. It's going to look like a dissection. It's going to be unmeasurable. So I strongly suggest that the CT be gated. Okay. I don't think there are many major centers where the CT would no longer be gated. I hope not. Okay. These are Go wonderful on. questions. Great. Um, okay. What else we got here? Um, so one uh, big question that I got asked a number of times ahead of time, which is about a type B dissection or descending dissection. Can you live forever with that without having to have surgery? Is it possible that it will just stand, stay dissected and you don't need to have surgery to repair it? You'll maybe just be on medication. The answer is yes, you can. A type B dissection um, is, is not as cogent or as threatening as a type A. A type A is here right in front of the chest on top of the heart. Those rupture. Mm -hmm. Those usually rupture. They can rupture very quickly and one can be gone in an instant. Mm -hmm. The descending aorta doesn't rupture that often. That's in the back and it's vertical. It's like a straight tube in the back. It's smaller, mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't rupture as easily with a dissection. Um, nine out of 10 patients can survive without an operation. And that's traditionally what we've achieved. Um, and we operate if the pain is very severe, if the aorta starts to leak. Um, mm -hmm. and now, and, and then those patients usually do well for a long time. It may take eight, 10, or 12 years with only medical therapy before the aorta grows big enough to be concerning. So that's what we've practiced for many, many years at the Aortic Institute at Yale. Yes, you can. Usually you don't need an operation and you usually do well thereafter. Once you go home, you should be fine. Once you go home after the acute event. Mm -hmm. Now the advent of endovascular therapy has changed all of that because the therapy is a lot easier to administer in terms of what the patient feels. He has a two hour procedure with a tiny little uh, needle hole and, and a, a stent that's put inside the aorta 
without a big operation between your ribs. Mm -hmm. So those uh, procedures are being done more often now. And it's very common for a patient to have that before he goes home from the acute dissection uh, okay. from, from that first week that the dissection has occurred. Okay, uh, very helpful. Um, okay, there. Um, uh, this is one I haven't seen answer before. Is what's the role of inflammation in dissection? Is there a role of that? That's a very advanced question, <laughs> uh, and and that reader's got to have some some background. Inflammation is irritation without infection. Everybody knows what an infection. If you if you cut your the, the tip of your finger to gets infected. It's red, mm -hmm. it becomes swollen, sure. and fluid oozes out. Sure. <laughs> Inflammation is the same thing absent any infection. It's a sterile uh, okay. inflammation. And um, it happens in the body for many reasons. Um, uh, rheumatic diseases, arthritis, are, are internal inflammation. There are no bugs, but it's the same process of swelling and irritation. Um, and that does involve the aorta, and, and for many, many aneurysms that develop, there is inflammation going on, and that participates in the destruction of the layers of the aortic wall. I love Italian food, and I think of the aorta like lasagna, mm -hmm. because the layers of elastin yeah. and collagen, you know, it's like the layers of lasagna, and they're curvy just like lasagna, and I'm making myself quite hungry here. Yeah, about. me too. <laughs> but um, it's it's made it's made of layers, and the inflammation gets into those layers, and it starts to break them down. So the answer is yes. Yeah, Amy, are layer. you getting hungry? The shape, yes. The shape of the layers are like the lasagna. You're absolutely layers. right. The <laughs> the shape of the aorta is like a. Like manicotti, oh, and that's what I was talking about. Oh, the manicotti. little things on the side. Okay, bye. I'm so too many food metaphors over here. I would like some spanakopita. I would like to use that analogy more. Bye. Now so, we're talking. Okay, take me away. How do I get out of here? So, staying a little bit on the food, um, but going in a different direction. We have a number of questions from folks who always want to say, "Is there a special diet I can take to stop my aneurysm from growing? Can I take a ginger or ginseng or?" Is there some you know, supplement or vitamin that will prevent me from having dissection? And a number of people wrote in with specific ones. So this is kind of gonna hopefully address all of these questions if you're out there and ask me a specific question about ginger tea or some specific vitamin. Ellen, I wish that there were, but there, there really isn't. Mm -hmm. I, I wish that there were. It's, it's a hope that we all have that there's a, um, you know, a spice or a food or a vegetable or a fruit, but there simply isn't. And this isn't part of your question, but, you know, uh, even medications, even mm -hmm. the, the best medications that we have, beta blockers and ACE inhibitors and ARBs, there are mm -hmm. lots of medical doctors who would argue with me, but it's hard to find consistent, replicable studies mm -hmm. that show a definite beneficial effect on outcome in patients with aneurysms. You can find some positive studies, you can find negative studies. In, in my book, the jury is still out as to whether even the medications that we give slow down the process of deterioration. However, mm -hmm. the, the, the metoprolol and the Lasartan uh, that, that are so often uh, prescribed, I think they do help because we haven't touched on it yet, but usually what causes dissection to happen is there's a diseased aorta, which is at least moderately enlarged, and then there's an acute emotional or physical event. Mm -hmm. You try mm -hmm. to push a car. You learn that uh, you know uh, your uncle has died. Um, your your business loses money. Your tax return comes back. Something really, really, really um, uh, uh, alarming or concerning. Mm -hmm. either physical or emotional, and that raises the blood pressure. And it's usually an acute event like that that triggers the dissection to occur. Mm -hmm. Now, the metoprolol will blunt the blood pressure response. It doesn't let your heart pound quite as hard. Your mm -hmm. heart is beating softer. 
and the Losartan will bring your, your highest blood pressure down. Mm -hmm. So those medications are helpful, I think, by preventing that um, acute event mm -hmm. under physical or emotional stress, even though the jury's out about whether they slow down or prevent the internal deterioration of the aortic wall. That very, very helpful answer there. I, I learned a lot there. Um, okay, um, we've got someone in the chat who says that they have Lois Dietz syndrome, which um, as we've touched on is one of the genetic syndromes that can predispose you to dissection and aneurysms. Um, it seems like they had repair already of their root but developed a pseudo aneurysm. Um, can you explain A, what that is? Because I think that might be a term people don't know. And um, B, what do you do when you have something like this happen, especially in this woman's case as a patient with Lewis Dietz syndrome? Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's, a, it's a Greek word, both uh, pseudo and aneurysm. Um, and and, and uh, pseudo means um, not real. The fake. So when we take a graft and we hook that up to the aorta, mm -hmm. we put about uh, 25 or 30 fine stitches in there to hold those together. Mm -hmm. And we don't leave the operating room until that's secure. But every now and then, um, especially if the aortic wall is thin mm -hmm. and weak, with every heartbeat, those stitches pull on the tissue. Okay. And the needle hole itself can stretch. Mm -hmm. Or a little tear can occur, like a cheese cutter, where mm -hmm. the, the sharp um, sure. uh, uh, suture material can cut through the tissue. And then that means that there's a little opening there. Mm -hmm. Now, if that happened in the early hours after surgery, the, the patient would exsanguinate internally. Mm -hmm. the, the blood would, would leak out. But if it happens a little bit later, or if it happens gradually, the surrounding tissues buttress that little leak, and it doesn't cause free bleeding. Mm. But little by little, it, it makes a cavity there full of blood. It might be the size of a raisin, and then in two months, it's the size of a grape, and then a few months later, it's the size of a plum. And that's what a pseudoaneurysm is. It, it's it's a, a, a bump on an aorta, that really isn't aortic tissue, so it's not a real aneurysm, but it's a disruption of the aortic wall, so the blood has leaked out, mm -hmm. and the surrounding tissues have held that back. Um, some of these don't need anything if they're small and not progressing. Okay. Um, uh, if, they're, if they're progressing, they need therapy. They mm -hmm. either need an open operation, or, or oftentimes these days, because it's a tiny little spot that causes it, it can be layered, it can be covered with a, a stent graft. Okay. Uh, great. Um, uh, sort of following up on that, um, but speaking more generally about sizes and when to intervene or not, um, why is there just not one number that we can tell everyone and say, this is the magic number when your aorta is this size, that's when you need surgery? Yeah. Are you still there, Ellen? Uh, Ellen, your, your picture's not moving anymore and I'm not hearing you. But let me answer what I heard so, so far. So, uh, you know, we've worked for the last 25, 30 years at the Aortic Institute at Yale trying to answer that question. At what size should the dilated aorta be removed? We've worked, we've worked very hard on that. Dr. John Rizzo, a world-class epidemiologist, has helped us with all the calculations. And uh, we can tell you that um, on average, for the ascending aorta, it should be removed somewhere around 5 to 5.5 centimeters. In a few weeks at the AATS Aortic Symposium, I'm going to be arguing we should move the criterion from 5.5 to 5. Um, operating at numbers in that range uh, prevents death. Very few people would die from rupture. Uh, but yet you're not moving too early 
before the aneurysm itself is dangerous. But think about this. Now, now we know that every different gene, and we have 47 or 50 of them now, uh, and Diana Milowitz has, has been key in identifying these. Every different gene affects the aorta a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. So we, we now give numbers and, and we publish a timeline. It's like a ruler with the, the level of diameter at which each different gene should be operated for the oh, ascending aorta. That's so, and that's published every, every two years in our journal Aorta, A-O-R-T-A. That's the name of the journal and we publish that from Yale University. So uh, even your readers, now your readers are probably very sophisticated at getting information online. Um, or I can provide it uh, to you, Ellen, uh, but mm -hmm. it can show you for your gene about where you should be operating. And then uh, keep in mind, you know, uh, uh, if, if Amy had an aneurysm, she wouldn't be operated at the same dimension as Will Chamberlain because body their mass. body sizes are mm -hmm. so different. Right, 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 okay? right. So it's hard to make one particular number. Now, mm -hmm. along with diameter, uh, we, we have also investigated the length of the aorta. And we found that the length is a little more accurate as a predictor. From, from the top of the heart to the beginning of the aortic arch, if we measure that length, it's a little bit more accurate than, than diameter. But I can tell you that uh, applying a, a principle for the average sized individual, somewhere between five and 5.5 centimeters, for most aneurysms is very effective. We've studied that at Yale and it, it weeds out those who are in danger and it's not operating too early for patients who don't need it. Can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? Please. I don't know, can, is, am I echoey? Probably. Um, okay, a little bit, but not I bad. Didn't, I didn't understand when you said about the, are you talking about the length of the aneurysm or you're talking about that person, the length of that per that particular person from this to this, like it would be a, like a body mass index, but this is just like a one measurement. Yes, Amy, both actually. Oh. Uh, and, and you're making me clarify that further. I'm talking about the actual length of the aorta. When the aorta dilates in diameter, mm -hmm. it also lengthens. The aorta is normally straight. They're pretty straight between the heart and the aortic arch. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty vertical tube. Then as it lengthens, it, it comes out and forms a C mm. like that. Because it's got to it's gotta form a, a C as it elongates. It's got to go somewhere. Oh, it's I not going to come out of the body. So it forms a curve. So if you measure that curve, it actually predicts a little bit better than diameter. I totally, uh, I understand what you're saying now. I didn't understand when you said length, but it's like if you take a, um, a detour, take in detour, as my dad used to say, oh, look, we have to take detour. And so it's actually a longer way around. It's like a longer, okay. I didn't, I, okay, I get it. I think I get it. I thought you were saying like when you look at someone and you like look at their phenotype, in terms of like mitral valve and stuff where you're like, oh, this is compressed, like how their heart grew, just the natural history of their body. But you're talking about the actual aneurysm length. I have never heard that before. That's so cool. Yeah, and that we do correct for body size too. Yes. Now, if we try to do a, a food analogy, uh, a carrot is perfectly straight. Yeah. And that's the way the aorta is before it dilates and lengthens. A banana which is curved is more like the shape of the aorta when it's um, it's elongated. It has so does to that mean that the, the actual smooth muscle, because it, okay, we'll talk about this. I'm thinking of it like uh, a pair of pantyhose or they, what they used to call the Chinese finger traps. I was thinking if it got wider, it would get shorter because it would pull out, but, but the actual, disruption of in between the cells makes the whole thing bigger it like adds to it the wow. whole thing stretches yes cool okay thank you that's fascinating um do you want to stick around amy and see if there's other questions you want to throw in um yeah if meredith uh, says it's okay i don't want to <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so here we've got one in the chat. Um, if you've had a repair of an ascending or root aneurysm, are you done? Is there a possibility you could have another aneurysm elsewhere in your aorta? Um, you know, of course, people are always going to worry. So, <laughs> um, it, how how reliable can they say? Oh, well, I'm fixed forever. My aorta is perfect now after you've had a graft or other uh, elective repair of an, an aneurysm. These are just wonderful questions, and um, I like to make it so that if I'm operating on your aneurysm through the front, through a median stenotomy, through the breastbone, I like to make it one and done. I like to be sure you're never going to need another operation there. Now, everybody has different philosophies. Uh, an operation is a big deal. I don't want my patient to ever need that. And one can accomplish that uh, in the vast majority of cases by doing everything needed at the bottom of the aneurysm next to the heart and everything needed at the top. So to, to do everything at the bottom, sometimes you have to do not just replacing the tube, but what is called a root replacement. And you guys are familiar with that. Uh, your audience may not be entirely familiar with that. So you may have to go down to where the valve is and do some fancy footwork and then reattach the coronary arteries to go all the way down into the heart to the very bottom of the ascending aorta. So that makes it a little bit bigger. And then at the top, uh, it, it's an inexperienced surgeon might might stop short of the aortic arch, even though the aortic arch is somewhat dilated. So it's important up there if you have dilatation uh, or uh, some bad connective tissue disease to go up and take care of the arch the first time. So if you do everything that is needed at the bottom and at the top, it, it should be one and done. It should be one and done. Now, not everybody needs the very bottom and the very top done. Most patients don't. But if you if you make it a very comprehensive operation the first time, it can it can definitely be one and done. Now, I can't tell you that you'll never get something that in the descending aorta. You know, you may, but that's a different kettle of fish. Yes, Amy. Okay. The the hemodynamics just the force at which your um, the the blood just in a normal person not even high blood pressure or whatever how it is ejected into and what part of the the aorta gets the most force the most like stress on it 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 must be a little bit different for everybody right if it's an an an, an does a does a um, bicuspid aorta the old thing, which came first, is a bicuspid aorta, can it cause damage because it is ejected in an odd angle that's not really, your body's not designed to take it at? Or is a bicuspid aorta just another, um, I'm not gonna say symptom, another feature of someone who's gonna be aneurysmal anyway? Wow, that's a wonderful question. And, and experts have, argued about that wondering about vehemently, your vehemently for 50 years and usually when you can't resolve something like that is it bad tissue with in the order when you have a bicuspid valve or is it the jet like the jet from a, jet. a garden hose you know, jet, if, that's if you turn it, uh, and and usually when you can't resolve an argument like that it's both and indeed it's both the aorta, the aorta wall is abnormal in patients with a bicuspid aortic valve. There's no question about it. The inflammation, the enzymes, the proteolysis, you know, breaking down of the tissue, it's abnormal. But also that jet, it's like you take your garden hose and you, you make it as strong of a, a stream as you can. That's hitting the opposite wall of the aorta too hard. And that makes it bulge out. You're exactly right, Amy. So it's actually both. It's an innate weakness of the wall of the aorta in the bicuspid patient and it's the force of that jet hitting the lateral wall of the ace and the aorta it's both my beef with this is not what you're saying but when i ask this question is i run into so many people i'm not a doctor i don't want to say well that's not how i heard it that's not what but someone, and I've heard it from the stage of people kind of giving testimony about their bicuspid aorta, 
And they're like, the reason that I had an aneurysm, the doctor explained, it was like when you put your thumb over the jet of a jet, now I know the word, of a, of a garden hose. And so it doesn't like, it squirts out like too hard on, onto the wall. And what I have heard is people saying, now that I have my bicuspid aorta replaced either with a, you know, biological or a, a mechanical valve, I'm never going to, I'm cured. I'm never going to get an aneurysm again. And if what you're saying is that it, that you may just be prone to aneurysms just by your biology, you would have to be followed very, very carefully after you've had that, because that might be the first thing that was going to happen. I don't want to scare anybody with a bicuspid aorta, but every time I hear that, I'm like, and you're not, you may be out of the woods, but it's like a long haul. If that's your biology, you know, if you are just going to be susceptible to this or at risk. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> you say my name like that. I'm like, Amy, you're I'd very friendly. in front of the class. I'd never get into Yale, but I'd be like, I have a question. What, what you've posed is exactly the question that I was given uh, for the valve society meetings that we just had. Uh, oh and they said, gotten lost in the mail, Dr. E. <laughs> they, they said, uh, uh, John, we want you to, to tell us what you would do right. for a patient who needed the bicuspid valve replaced, yeah. but his aorta wasn't that enlarged. Yeah. And the textbook answer is if it's greater than five, you take it out. But my answer was if it's greater than four, just be done with it. Follow the one and done principle. Honestly. And and it turns out that at Cleveland Clinic and in my practice, I we put it all up. I didn't know exactly what I had done. I hadn't thought about it before, but I had taken out just about everything over four. If yeah. it's under four, Amy, you know, you're gonna live another 30 years before yeah. it ever trouble. So if if you take it out above four or uh, if you're not that comfortable above 4.5, yeah. you're going to pretty much nullify uh, the danger of that aorta and achieve one and done. Interesting. Okay. And I'm, I can't like talk to people. Uh, uh, I can only say this is what I've heard or blah, da, 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 da. But um, it's interesting to talk to different surgeons about that. I'm, I'm team Dr. E, just in case. Yeah, you can get a lot. Everything we're talking about, there's a lot of science involved, but there's a lot of opinion. And, yeah. and our opinions are formed for many different reasons. One of us might have had a bad experience, you know, taking right. out an aorta that wasn't that, that, that large. And then that, that stays with you. You never forget yeah. that case. That's so right. we're all molded. We're molded by our individual experiences. Mm -hmm. Understood. And the patient's experience and, and, and circumstances too. There, I mean, you might... I'm going to let you go on with your thing. I'm talking too much, but I'm just saying it's not a nothing thing that happens. It's not getting, it's not that, it, you know, it's not getting a vasectomy or getting your ears pierced. It's a trauma to your body and your body doesn't know the difference between a wonderful thing just happened that gave you life and you were in a freaking car accident. Your body still yes. has to recover that way. And not just from the perfusion and everything, but emotions and all. So that's why when you say one and done, because some people have just enough to get through that surgery and maybe they have a caretaker at that time, but then they don't. So the next time they might need a, I'm saying downstream, I don't know if that's what you call it. I think I know um, something else. They might not be in a position to do it. So I hope people, um, I hope people go to you. Okay, I'm out. I'll stay on. Um. <laughs> With re relating to the valve, um, we had uh, someone mention that they've had they had their valve replaced almost 30 years ago. Uh, do you have to be on blood thinners for your entire life for this? Um, at this point, uh, he wants to know if he can maybe say goodbye to that. And does everyone who has their valve replaced have to be on blood thinners? First of all, let's clarify for the uh, audience that you have. Biological valves usually don't require any blood thinner at all, a pig or a cow. Uh, so this question uh, is really focused on mechanical valves. The short answer is yes. Um, we don't recommend that any mechanical valve not be anticoagulated. Uh, let me expand on that a little bit. The, the questioner um, is, is, is really thoughtful. 
because the cloth, the, the cloth sewing ring of the valve, it does get covered by the body's tissues. Once the body's tissues cover it, we think it's no longer going to be a source of clots. But you've got a, a lot of plastic in there, you know, and, and, and no one would, uh, no, no doctor would recommend not anticoagulating a mechanical valve. Having said that, I have two provisos to, to express. One is that I have a, a friend in Puerto Rico, a surgeon, who told me that his patients don't take Coumadin no matter what he does, and they don't seem to do too bad. Okay, so there are environments where maybe there's not good access to health care where, where patients have valves. As I recall, in Australia, many years ago, um, Aborigines were not anticoagulated, but I think there were quite a few events. Hmm. Now, that having been said, I'm not going to mention the valve type, but there is one valve that now is in a trial without Coumadin. Wow. With, with an alternate anticoagulant called Eliquis. And that's the, the medication that's advertised every night when you're watching TV, oh. seven o'clock, eight o'clock. Uh, it's a very effective blood thinner for atrial fibrillation, for spontaneous uh, clots in the veins and the legs. It's the first time that a non-Coumadin uh, approach has been taken. Now, the Eliquis, you know, there's no blood test. There's no adjustment of your dosage. So far, the trial is working out well. I'm one of the investigators for the trial. We have a lot of patients on it. They're doing very, very well. The, the initial ones were brave because it's uncharted territory. And I was a little worried, you know, asking them to participate. But uh, now there's uh, three years uh, maximal experience. There are, wow. no, there are no signals of un, untoward or um, unduly frequent adverse events. I think that's gonna be okay. It's gonna take another two to two and a half years or three years to finish the trial with a thousand patients. But I think that's wow. gonna be the alternative. I think that'll change, that'll be like a sea yeah. change. That's Absolutely. gonna change the, 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 the selection of valves. Don't, would you agree with that? Me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ellen would know. But yeah, because people oh, talk to me about their valve. People talk to me about their valves all the time and mechanical. Because honestly, some people say that's the first choice I got. It's the only. Do you know what I mean? Because you're talking to them, especially with people who are like, emerge whatever the the surgery is. You have choices, but when they give you that, the doctor says this or that, and. It, there's always a conversation around that. That will change that conversation, which you're right, changes everything. Huge. And, and again, surgeons are, they're, they're human beings like everyone else and they have feelings. I have a colleague who, who came up to me one day and he said, John, how could you do that? I said, Mike, Mike, what did I do? He said, you put a mechanical valve in that man. And I think it's a great thing. I know it's gonna last him for the rest of his life. Right. But that surgeon, hates to have anything other than mm -hmm. native tissue or biological valve. Uh, mm -hmm. He's my vintage, you know, it's just a, just a different, and we're all formed by early events and, and early teachings. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. Which may uh, have been anomalous events, but they affect you in a seminal way because they happened early on in your career. Right. We Beautiful have a really work. great question here Same that I would love to to hear your answer to. Um, it's kind of a holistic question. If someone knows they have a surgery coming up for aortic aneurysm, is there one thing you can think of, whether physical, emotional, family, you know, spiritual, that you would suggest people can do to make their experience better? Whether it's, you know, working out and getting in shape ahead of time, being on a healthy diet, having a care system, you know, whatever uh, you, you can tip you could think of to offer folks that they might not have heard if they're just kind of Googling about this, the actual mechanics of what the surgery is. Yeah, thank you, Ellen. I have, I have a couple answers for that. Um, one is that I, I want those individuals to know that in the present era, they have a 98 to 99% likelihood of coming out from the operating room alive and intact and perfectly fine. Amazing. And then they have every reason 
to continue to live a long life. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's not that likely that further aneurysms would occur downstream. And once you have a heart surgeon, you know, you're going to be followed every couple of years, every two, three years. We haven't talked at all about follow-up. I can address that if you want. But you're going to be followed every two to three years. So nothing's going to get away from you. It's not like, you know, when I was training uh, more than 30 years ago, it was a crapshoot. If you really had to be replaced, you know, that was, that was a dangerous event. Now 98 to 99 percent safety level at major centers who specialize in this disease. Now, the other theme of your question was um, preparation. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, patients uh, struggle with morbid obesity and, and they have an aneurysm. And those two don't go well together. You know, the, the major aortic surgery together with morbid obesity, they're bad bedfellows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we have a program that we followed now for about eight or nine years. And when they need the aneurysm out, we qualify them for cardiac reasons for expedited bariatric surgery, wow. expedited surgery for them to lose wow. weight. And within three months to six months, they've lost, you know, 60 pounds. Wow. They, they're much better candidates. And then we operate safely for the order. You know, if you have that much fatty tissue to get to the breastbone, you're not going to be able to do a good job. And that mm -hmm. wound's not going to heal well. So that, that's a program that I recommend for patients who uh, suffer with uh, morbid extreme uh, obesity. Is, and it that, works well for them. I apologize. Is, is part of it also, because I, I understand that, more likely for high blood pressure? Or is yeah. The, and the other thing is, and I remember this from when my, my brother-in-law had surgery because he has cerebral palsy, um, the idea of what the usual rehab or like, oh, you're okay, has to do with that ambulatory thing. You walked across the room. Well, he may need a little longer to be able to walk across the room, you know? So yeah. that makes sense to me. So kind of a, and then a sedentary lifestyle that might come along with being large size also seems like the recovery would be so much harder because you're trying to you're you're trying to perfect circulation and you're you're cutting it off at some points that's amazing about the expedited bariatric surgery yeah, that's I um, is that just that's... well have you ever heard of that ellen no i hadn't but what a great yeah. program so i hope folks yeah. who this might apply to are going to look into that yeah for other surgeries too you know, the other um, uh, surprising feature of that program is that about 90% of the entrants into that morbid obesity aneurysm program have kept the weight off after it. I thought you were going to say that just because there's like an That's also amazing. a life saving. It's one thing saying this is killing me, but also knowing that that surgery is your surgery is saving their lives and they get a shot at, I, I know, I, I just think it's wonderful. I had never heard of that. I'll get more info on that for you. Yeah, okay. that's fantastic. Um, okay, let's, let's squeeze in a few more tiny guys here. Um, we've got, how long should patients expect their recovery to take on average, of course, knowing that everyone is different? Yeah. Well, we like to have everybody home on the fifth day after the operation. That's for elective wow. cases, you know, that are done as planned procedures. Um, that's not for the guy who comes in, you know, with a ruptured thoracal abdominal aorta. But uh, sure. they should be home about the fifth day. I think they do better once they get home. Um, by, by one month, you should be feeling pretty well. We're talking about an operation in the front now. You should be feeling pretty well and be able to get back to work, uh, mm -hmm. depending on your job. But for a non-physical job, by one month, you should be back to work. You should be walking okay. a mile or two a day by one month. That's great. <laughs> I don't do that. That's amazing. <laughs> we should all be striving to do that, I guess. <laughs> My brother I don't believe 
Tommy said to um, not his surgeon, but somebody else who just came in and didn't have all the charts and everything yet. Somebody was like pushing him down the hallway. And he said, after this operation, will I be able to play basketball? And they said, sure, it'll take a while. And he's like, good, because I've never been able to play. And then like he held up his, <laughs> one of his like crutches. And I'm like, I love that that sense of humor. But that's the thing. It's about getting back to normal or better than normal, better than your usual activity level. Yeah. Yeah. And if you've had valve disease too, you'll feel a, a, a kick. You know, your your heart will be able to do much more. Wow. If you've had valve disease too. Wonderful. Wow. Um, <clears throat> okay. What do we got here? Um, okay. So, so this is switching gears a little bit, talking about what you spoke about in the webinar um, and genetic testing and knowing your family history. Um, if someone is the only person in their family that's had a dissection, how far out should they be worried about? You know, they have their own children, maybe siblings, parents. Should they be thinking about their cousins? You know, you know, their uncles, aunts, grandparents. You know, how far do we go if you're the only person in your family who has disease yet that we know about? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so let let's talk about a, a broad general principle, and these are you know approximations. They're averages, sure. but mm -hmm. uh, two thirds of the time. Uh, an aneurysm patient has received the abnormal gene from his mom or dad. But one third of the time, it starts with that patient. It's got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. So sure. <laughs> in broad general terms, about two thirds of the time, you've got it from your from your parents. And one third of the time, it just, it, it, it happened when the, the sperm and the egg were forming and they came together and so on, that that one genetic letter got switched. It's usually one genetic letter out of 2.2 billion wow. that causes an aneurysm to occur. One letter out of 2.2 billion. In that respect, thoracic aortic aneurysm is a lot simpler than most other diseases. I'm, I'm not downplaying the severity or the importance, sure. but, but it's different if you have 100 different genes contributing a little bit, right. or, or one letter, one single genetic letter being the difference between having an aneurysm or not. So that, that's one important point about how it usually comes about. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I would recommend a broad screening, even if nobody else has manifested an aneurysm. And, and also, please remember um, that many patients with aneurysms, who, who succumb to aneurysms, are signed out as a heart attack. Yes. Uncle Phil had a heart attack. But John very Pat, often, Tex Ritter, I'm so sorry, but John, Diana, Dr. Milowitz was the first one who said to me, what a, how did John and Tom's, you know, at that time it was just John, but then Tom, how did their dad pass away? And I'm like, well, the story is, I, I might have told you this before, but he was, he was a singing cowboy. He was a MC at the Grand Ole Opry. He was bailing one of his band members out of jail in Nashville. Tommy was there, his his oldest son, Tommy, and he just clutched his chest, which people think heart, and fell over, died. And he was like, I think he was in his 60s. And that goes into that cardiac category if he wasn't under a, somebody's care who was looking at his aorta and in the 70s, they were not. And also it's if there's no autopsy. And if there's no medical examiner, the family will never know. Now, would they have been as astute in those days to like, if they had found it, oh God, Tex Ritter died of an, a thoracic aortic dissection to, to warn the kids? I don't think even in those days, but that's why when I talk to people and they tell me the thing about, well, this one died and that one died. And if somebody passed away young, it just, it doesn't, I'm not even saying that it might be that they uh, died of an aneurysm and you don't know it, they might have been, their body would go on to develop an aneurysm, but they died from something else. Do you know? So it's, I'm all for the wide, the wide whatever testing. And I'm, I, of course, I'm not a doctor, but at least warn everybody so they can be aware that they have a second cousin once removed, which Ellen will explain, or I will, what, <laughs> what that is, because it's fascinating when you dig a little bit. I'm on the exact same page as you are, Amy. Thank yeah. you for 
expressing that so well. I would argue for wide, wide testing, at least brothers and sisters, parents, children, and, and, and further, like Amy said. Now, when, let me tell you guys. No, when you say testing, are you talking about genetic testing or somebody dies or somebody is, is diagnosed and then everybody needs to get an echo right away to make sure that they aren't rocking, rocking. They aren't uh, carrying around an, an aneurysm that they don't know about. I mean, that's what Dr. Milowitz told us immediately everybody make sure that they are not the next person in line to have this happen and then do the genetic testing. Uh, wonderful point, Amy. I'm recommending both. The Got imaging it. has to be done. That's, that's step one. Um, and then, and then uh, somebody has to be tested. Um, yeah. The patient with the aneurysm is, is the one that should be tested first. Right. If, if, if there's no variant found, and now, Ellen, we're getting into your territory. Yeah. If, there's no variant, if there's no variant found in what we call the proband, the patient who's pre presenting to us with an aneurysm, then, then you're not going to find anything in the children or, or the parents. But, but um, uh, the pr so the program should be tested genetically and all the relatives should be um, imaged. If the proband is positive, then it's very easy to test all the relatives for that one genetic letter. And, and let me tell you something, Amy, I think you'll, you'll like this, even though it's a bad, bad subject, I, I think you'll love the brilliance of this. What is it? In Japan, in Japan, um, uh, they've taken a different approach to determining the cause of sudden death. In, in this country, we would think of doing an autopsy, but who wants that? You know, families often don't want it. It's kind of a, a bad moment. thing to think about. Awful. So, so what they do is everybody who died in their emergency room, this is two hospitals in Japan, they did a post-mortem CAT scan autopsy. Uh, Top of the yeah, head to bottom of the head. Just for expense. Oh, that's fascinating. That's fantastic. Amazing. Isn't that brilliant? And they always found the cause of death. Wow. Whether it was a heart attack or a stroke or a, an abdominal perforation, they always found the cause of death. Their statistics now, I would, are spectacular. Yes, and that's what I'm getting to next. I would have thought that ruptured type A dissection would have been maybe a tenth of 1%. It was a staggering 8.3% of all wow. sudden deaths. Come on. And from how many years did they do this thing? And was this during COVID time? Sorry, I'm going to get it. I'll call you and we'll go over the data. It was before COVID. Right. And it was done on a reasonable number of patients. I think hundreds of patients, as I recall. Isn't that wow. brilliant? That's a, what a, wow. It makes so much sense. It's kind but I mean, Dr. Cool. Miller is all over that about medical examiners, but that's, it, I thought you were going to say, because I read somewhere that someone dies in the hospital, it's treated as kind of like a murder investi investigation where it's like, you don't, nobody like, they like just kind of interview everybody to see what happened, but that's, that's great. Can you um, imagine? We are, are you coming up that? to Justin at Yale. At the hospital? You know, Amy, I haven't tried because, you know, they're going to say, first of all, who's going to pay for it? And it's kind of a, a, a radical idea that most people haven't heard of. Uh, but I think it's just brilliant. I and I think we should do it <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> After surgery, yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Um, so we are coming up to just an hour. So we have to let our expert go because he is very busy and we really, really appreciated his time with us. Um, if you missed his webinar um, from March with us, uh, we're going to put a link in the window here that you can click to rewatch that on our Love website. Um, so you can see and share it with your family and friends um, and anyone else who might be interested. Um, additionally, we, this series will go on for the rest of the year. So if you have a question that we didn't get to today, I, I am sorry, but I promise we are going to continue asking many experts questions over the course of the year. So you can register for that series. Um, once you sign up there, you will be registered for the rest of them. So, um, you should get these notices regularly. Once should one wear a medical month. bracelet? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I just grabbed oh, that. The last Friday of the month. Um, and uh, I, with that, I think that's it. Oh, one last question. I just got texted. 
do you recommend um, cardiac rehab after surgery? Um, only if you need it. Uh, if, if you're healthy coming in, uh, you should be up on your feet in five days. You should start walking, you know, work up to a mile or two at one month. And, and you don't necessarily need that. If you have a compromised heart that isn't pumping well, or you have arrhythmias, yeah, of course. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, thank you again so much. We've all learned a lot. I know Amy and I both feel like we've learned a ton and I hope our audience has as well. Please continue following along with us and join us in thanking Dr. Elif Teriades for his time and expertise and sharing it with uh, all of us here in the aortic Opa, disease world. Thank you. Opa, thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity. Good right. job, guys. Thank Talk you. See you later. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.